Hi, my name is Ollie Lansdowne and I work with students here at All Souls. Here's what you can expect during our time together. We're going to confess our sins to God and receive assurance of his forgiveness. We're going to hear from God's word, the Bible, and have it preached into our lives. We're going to take up a financial offering and bring our needs to God in prayer. And we're going to do a lot of singing, not because we're any good, but because our God is worth singing about. So bring your tears as well as your smiles, bring your messes as well as your successes, because this is a family of misfits and letdowns gathered together by the grace of God, which means you are so welcome here. Jump to your feet and let's sing together. God is mighty. 
The scriptures tell us that we shouldn't hide our sins from God, but rather confess them to him and receive forgiveness out of his infinite goodness and mercy. It's something we should do everywhere and anywhere, but especially when we meet together as a church family. So can I invite everyone who is willing to lift up your voice to the throne of heavenly grace with me and pray the words in bold. Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have failed you as did your first disciples. We ask for your mercy and your help. Our selfishness betrays you. Lord, forgive us. Christ, have mercy. Our treatment of others brings shame to you. Lord, forgive us. Christ, have mercy. We fail to share the pain of your suffering. Lord, forgive us. Christ, have mercy. We run away from those who abuse you. Lord, forgive us. Christ, have mercy. We are afraid of being known to belong to you. Lord, forgive us. Christ, have mercy. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. We're now going to pray the words that our Saviour taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. I hope you're well this morning. We're going to take a little break from our series in the Book of Acts to look at one of my all-time favourite books. Here it is, God's Very Good Idea by Trillia Newbell. Some of you may have seen your parents being really sad over the last few weeks, maybe even a bit angry. And you might be really sad too. And that might be because of things they've been seeing in the news and watching on TV. You see, boys and girls, some people in our world treat each other badly, not because of something they've done, but because of the colour of their skin. You might have seen that happen at school. It might have even happened to you. It's really unfair and it's very confusing. And as Christians, when we're confused about something, we can go to God's word, the Bible, to find some answers. And this book, God's Very Good Idea, helps us to understand what the Bible says. And I'm going to share with you a few things about it now. You see, boys and girls, in the beginning, God had a very good idea. His big idea was to make people, lots of different people, to fill the world with people who would love him and love each other. And he would make people in his image. They would be like mirrors reflecting what God is like. Because God is full of love, they would be full of love too. Some were men, some were women. Some were tall, some were short. Some liked music, some liked sport. Some had darker skin, some had lighter skin. Some had curly hair, some had straight hair. And even though they were all different, they were all made in God's image and very precious. I wonder how many people you know that look different to you. It was a very good idea. But, boys and girls... People ruined God's very good idea. They chose not to love God, and that's called sin. And because of their sin, they chose not to love each other. And we're the same. We sin. Sometimes we can treat people badly because they look different to us. We can even hurt others because of the colour of their skin. We all need forgiveness for ruining God's very good idea. 
But God had a very good plan to rescue his very good idea. He came to earth in the person of Jesus. Jesus shows us how to love each other. Jesus loved people who were different to him. He loved people no one else loved. But people didn't love Jesus. They put him on a cross to die. But this was part of God's plan. On the cross, Jesus took our sins so we could be forgiven. And then he rose from the dead and gave people his spirit to help them enjoy loving him and loving others. One day, boys and girls, God will finish his very good idea. He will make the world perfect again. And it will be full of people with different languages and different coloured skin. And they will love God and love each other forever. And we can enjoy a little sneak peek of that now in our church family. Today is a day that we say thank you to God for all that he's done for us. So shall we pray now and thank him for his very good idea? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for making people to be different. Thank you that we're all made in your image. Sorry when we treat others badly and don't love them as you do. Thank you for Jesus and his spirit who help us love each other. Amen. So, boys and girls, I think you should ask your parents right now to buy you this brilliant book. I have a few spare copies, so if they say no, I'll have a word with them, and you can always have one of mine. But right now, we're going to sing a song called Wonderful Lord. While you sing, why don't you think about how you can love others more like Jesus does? Let's stand and sing. Isn't it great that even though we're scattered right around London and the world, we're still able to sing together and even see other members of our church family. Johnny Dyer is now going to catch up with another member of our church family. Hi, I'm here with uh, my good friend Dada. Uh, we've known each other for many years. Although Dada, I think you've been around all souls longer than me. Is that right? Yes, I would think so. We've been there more than 18 years. Oh, yeah which has been a very happy 18 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, we couldn't ask for anything better than that when we moved to London. Also, it's a wonderful place for us because God has used the family of the church in our family life, in our ministry life here in London, as well as in Liberia. So in reality, also family as a church, it's a gift to us. And we have been blessed immensely by the church and the family and individuals. And we so praise God for being, he set us in this family. <laughs> and it has been a great blessing for us. Tell us, Dada, just a little bit about, I mean, you work with London City Mission. Uh, tell us a little bit about what, what, what that involves. 
I'm with the London City Mission, and we have been in King's Cross area working from a center called Paget Christian Center. Our ministry is, you know, in a district. In fact, I call it our office is the district, is not the building. The building is great God resource to go out into our office and bring people into the building and have a comfortable time to share the word of God with them. Now, our ministry uh, ranges from, you know, children or toddlers to senior citizens. Throughout the week, we reach out in a district through door-to-door -door work. We invite people into the building. We do one-on-one -on -one sharing of the gospel. And then uh, we run various activities. We do children and family ministry, and that gave us a big opportunity to be in the heart of the uh, estates and the community, meeting with mothers with two, three, four children, most of them single mothers, and from diverse backgrounds, black, white, and uh, you know, different blacks as well. And that gave us a real huge opportunity to be able to speak to them about God and their children. And then we do a lot of senior citizens' work as well, reaching to their home, spending time with them, doing some practical things for them. And then we try to reach out and engage with local churches, you know, to network and to encourage them to reach out within their neighborhoods. So those are the things that we do in a week and are spending time in prayer and taking part in different outreaches within the districts. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we're grateful we've been able to pray with you. You've been a mission partner uh, of All Souls for years. So we've journeyed with you uh, through your ministry and we know that it's, it's challenging ministry and um, mm -hmm. just a, you know, one of the things, and you know this, we, we talk um, as a church and we celebrate and we love the fact that All Souls is a global church. And, and uh, we talked about this before. It's a complete mix of colors and race and ethnicity. I guess that's the kind of people you're ministering to in, in your own day, ministry day in, day out. And that is a wonderful thing. It's a, it is a picture of heaven, but Sadly, we are living in a broken and fallen world. So let, let me just ask you, you know, Dada, you, you would seen the horrific events uh, unfolding because of this tragic murder of George Floyd. Uh, how are you feeling about that? Uh, it is a difficult time, you know, not only for me personally, but also trying to get, especially somebody who is cross-cultural married with children who are mixed race but black, you know, it is, it, it is time to really be able to think biblically, truthfully through the lenses of God or through the lens of God and to be able to see where all these things are rooted which is sin. Now, when it comes to also, I always say, as a family of God, if we can send missionaries all over the world, support missionaries all over the world, which I'm part of, because my ministry in Liberia is well supported, and people in Liberia have become Christian through the work. Now, our vision is to bring people together to build a church of Christ. So with that, it is the same vision that I have when I'm looking at the condition in the world and what's happened to George, you know, in America. Now, it, it inflames emotion, but this emotion, where do we channel it? It is through the eyes of God. Now, People, when I'm explaining that to my own children, I say to them, look at Cain and Abel. They were family. But Cain killed Abel. 
So that has its root in sin. Be a racism, discrimination, prejudice, and all of these things, they have their root in sin. Now the world can do all they can to address it, but our Christians, church, are the one who are standing in a gap to share light, to shine light on sin, and to bring the gospel to them. And that's my that's how my wife and I talk to our children. And we we have it is a great time and opportunity to really bring the Bible to hearts and minds, you know, at this time. And I see it as, uh, as a church. We have the opportunity to speak to other people who are directly affected by, you know, what's going on. Because racism affects certain group of people. You know, it, it creates the feeling of inferiority and so on. But in Christ, we have our confidence in the Lord. Mm. So with that, we have the, uh, if you like, we have the cure for racism. They will not finish because we are in flesh and blood. You know, like Paul said, the good I want to do, I can't do mm. because of this. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But one thing we know the spirit of the Lord can lead through it. Yes. I mean, talk about opportunity. I mean, I, you know, thinking about us as a church, as all souls, um, you know, we know that inequality and justice are, are, are not the way that it's meant to be. Um, mm -hmm. And we live in a fallen world. And it does seem, as you say, an opportunity for us as a church just to ask ourselves, how are we doing in these issues? Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, any, any thoughts, any wisdom, any blind spots that you, you could highlight for us, lessons that we could learn, things that we need to listen to? Yes. Uh, what I do with, uh, I, would, I, I would only give the example of what I do with uh, people in our area. I have this thing where I say, look, let me hear your story and you two hear my story. Now, usually I will get someone and, you know, say, look, What's your story? And then I will give them the platform, the time, and we will have honest and open discussion. Like, you know, a lady that I spoke to, you know, it was through the uh, uh, messenger, Facebook messenger, who asked me a question and said, why everybody hate us, the black people? And I said, what do you mean? He said, why white people hate us? And I said, but where did you get that from? Now I said, you tell me why. And then she told me about the incident with George Floyd, the, the virus, how it's killing a lot of black people because of their social condition. And then she talks about how black people have been, you know, thrown out of their flats and places in China. And, you know, she, she went on. What she said, they are all logical. But then I turned it around and said, do you want to hear my story as well? And she said, yes. And I said, my story is this. My father was killed in Liberia. He wasn't killed by white people. I said, I was driven out of Liberia. It wasn't white people that drove me out of Liberia. I said, where do you come from? Nigeria. I said, Boko Haram, they are not white people. They are black people. And that gave me opportunity to speak to her that all of these things I rooted in sin, be it white or black or Asian. And so what I'm trying to say, John, one of the, uh, you know, solution is to give maybe a platform to people who are directly affected by uh, racism or discrimination to share their experience, you know, so that the church or we as a family can intelligently pray into these situations. Because, I mean, again, I can give an example from our home. You know, what affects me and the children, my wife is not aware of it. 
when the children are walking on the street in Bali money, the love they get, my wife doesn't get. Yeah. So you see, even with family, the I think that, you know, my wife is blunt to, and the children's eyes are open to. So we need to see that. And I don't think it's, uh, it's something that we should fear. We, we need to have an open, earnest, biblical, and truthful conversations around these things. Because they are real. God, I thank you. That's so helpful. And uh, thank you for your honesty. And thank you for challenging us as a church family. And as you say, it's, uh, it's an opportunity. It's a journey we've been on as a church for years, actually. But maybe there are new lessons, exciting lessons that we can learn together. So bless you. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. Thanks. Thank you, John. Thanks. My name is Paula. I'm going to pray. And I hope as a church you will join me in these prayers. Heavenly Father, as we go through a time where a lot of people are angry and demanding change within the Black Lives Matter movement, guide us as a church on how to be part of the solution to changing racism. Help us to examine our thoughts, words and actions in alignment with your word. Challenge us to be honest and use the gospel to expose injustices within ourselves, the church, London, and the world. Open the minds of those in our community who do not recognize racism as a problem in the UK. Soften hearts and give us the willingness to hear each other's stories and language to have difficult conversations with each other. As a multicultural church, Lord, let us always be a church willing to ask ourselves, how are we contributing to an equal, just world for all? I ask for peace among the protesters, that no harm comes to anyone involved, whether it be those demanding change or the police that are there to protect. Give the government clarity and how best to move forward to eliminate racism in all sectors of our society. Amen. Father, as we are still in the grips of the COVID-19 pandemic, I pray for healing. Healing to all those whose lives have been impacted by the virus, whether it be losing a loved one or those needing hospitalization, those who have symptoms and are scared, those who are shielding, those who have worked in hospitals or in care settings and have seen the suffering firsthand. Lord, protect our mental health as some struggle to cope with the isolation, financial burden and sadness brought on by the situation. And as strict restrictions are lifted, protect us from a second wave. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray for all our mission partners serving you around the world. And today especially pray for Richard, Catherine, Marianne and Amy, who arrived back in London this weekend after serving for 20 years in Japan. As they spend the next two weeks in self-isolation in their flat and in the emotion and exhaustion of such major change, Grant them rest and quiet them with your love. Please guide them as they shape plans for the future. Amen. We pray for the prosecuted church and ask that you would give courage to our brothers and sisters from Muslim backgrounds in Malaysia as they face rejection from their family or spouse and as many are denied privileges afforded to others. We ask that they might know how much you love them and that you would surround them with Christian family who can support them. Amen. On this Thanksgiving and gift day, I pray that as we generously give, you direct the funds to grow your church as you see fit. Thank you for every member of our church family. Bless us, 
Continue to fill us with your spirit so that we may continue to be an encouragement to one another. Amen. Thank you, Paula, for praying for us this morning. We are living in dark days. At times like this, we're moved beyond ourselves towards someone much stronger. It's not that we needed God any less before, but many of us, our lives altered by events of these past weeks and months, now understand how dependent we are on him. It's Thanksgiving and gift day, and some of you may find it hard to think what we can give thanks for in this season. But actually, seasons like this, when everything is stripped back, when we see the fragility of life, and when the evil effects of sin is as raw as it has been, we give thanks that we are not without hope. We give thanks for Jesus, who through the cross came to redeem a broken world. A world where one day there will be no more pain or suffering, no more illness and no more injustice. So we give thanks because we are not without hope. We pour out our thanksgiving in gifts and it seems only right that we change our plans for thanksgiving and gift day to reflect that we face a very different world to the one we anticipated when we planned it back in those COVID-19 free days. We'll return to our building project in due course because it is integral to our gospel work. And I think we'd all agree our church home has become more precious to us since we've not been able to use it. Our calling as a church is to bring the good news of the gospel to a broken world. It is for us to be outward looking, to be faithfully present, ministering grace and mercy. We are to grieve with those who grieve. We are to mourn with those who mourn. The leadership team, the wardens, the ministry team and the PCC therefore feel it is right to give away today's collection, to divide it between London City Mission, who Dada works for, and who work among some of the most broken and divided people in London, and to worldwide projects, including those supporting persecuted Christians. You can find out more details on the All Souls website, and also there you'll find instructions of how to give. Also, those of you involved in youth will know Trevor did a really helpful talk last week. So please check it out if you want to engage more deeply with what the biblical response to racism is. And this book by Ben Lindsay is very helpful. Why we need to talk about race. We're shortly going to sing again, but before that, let me just say to our mission partners, Richard, Catherine, Mary and Amy, welcome back. Uh, they just arrived in London yesterday from Japan. And this is also the time and the service when we would generally take up the offering. Thank you so much for your generosity and giving. And as we remind each other every week, all things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given. to rest. 
church family. Today's reading is from 1 Samuel chapter 7 verses 2 to 17. It was a long time, 20 years in all, that the ark remained at kiriath Jerem, and all the people of Israel mourned and sought after the Lord. And Samuel said to the whole house of Israel, if you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths, and commit yourselves to the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their paths and Ashtoreths, and served the Lord only. Then Samuel said, Assemble all Israel at Mitzpah, and I will intercede for the Lord for you. When they had assembled at Mitzpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day they fasted, and there they confessed, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel was leader of Israel at Mizpah. When the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. And when the Israelites heard of it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. They said to Samuel, Do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. Then Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. But that day, the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic they were routed before the Israelites. The men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to a point below beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shem. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far has the Lord helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not invade Israelite territory again. Throughout Samuel's lifetime, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines. The towns from Ekron to Gath that the Philistines had captured from Israel were restored to her, and Israel delivered the neighbouring territory from the power of the Philistines. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel continued as judge over Israel all the days of his life. From year to year he went on a circuit, from Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah, judging Israel in all those places. But he always went back to Ramah, where his home was, and there he also judged Israel, and he built an altar there to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Monday night was one of the best evenings I've had at All Souls in 25 years, and I really mean that. There we were running Christian Explored online, which we'd never done before. We had all the tables full, and non-Christian relatives and friends of mine were Zooming in who would never have been able to come in person. They live far too far away. To be honest, I couldn't sleep because I was so excited. We are gonna do this again and again. So please do join us though tomorrow night, if you're not a Christian or investigating, 
or send friends to join us tomorrow night. If you are and you've got friends who'd love to hear about Jesus, we're going to look at who Jesus is, his identity. We're going to see what that means for ourselves and this world, why it's the central hope of the world. Now, one question we ask in week one is this. If God was here and you could ask him any question, what would it be? And a woman in my group asked totally sincerely, but with some anguish, what does God want from me? And to answer that, I want to refer back to Dada's interview just now. God wants you to take your sin seriously. If you're not a Christian, he wants you to take your sin seriously and the death of his son seriously. He wants you to meet Jesus as your saviour as he dies on the cross for you before you meet him as your judge at the end of your life, where you'll pay for your sin yourself in a place called hell. Now, if you are a Christian, God wants you to grow more like Jesus. And you can't begin to do that unless, again, you take battling against your sin seriously. And to take the key word which sums up uh, this morning's passage seriously, which is the word repentance. We have to see turning from sin and growing more like Jesus as of ultimate importance. I remember 15 years ago going to see John Stodd at his flat just off Weymouth Street three days after Christmas. Earlier that year, he'd fallen and broken his hip and he was now in real pain and pretty immobile. It had been a massive blow to lose his independence. But as I came into the flat, having let myself in because he couldn't get to the door, he didn't say, woe is me, I'm a victim, what is God doing? He said, Rico, I need you to pray for me. I've not coped well with this injury and I've behaved in a bad tempered and selfish way. Could you please pray that the Lord will forgive me my sin? Well, I said, me down. So I prayed for him. Lord God, Uncle John has been selfish and bad-tempered. Please forgive him. Please help him to change and be more gracious, particularly with those closest to him. As I prayed, I saw that he was weeping and nodding. And I left feeling pretty overwhelmed, as you can imagine, with my own sin. And knowing that this church had a leader who took his own sin seriously. And we do take our sin seriously. and We take the sin of racism seriously. And, and we want to say sorry. Uh, it was Jack Miller, a, a famous pastor's pastor, who said, if the pastor is not the chief repenter, then sin becomes a theoretical issue for theoretical sinners should there be any present that Sunday morning. And as we come to the issue of race that we're facing at present, we mustn't, as individuals in this church family, be defensive. A, a black woman is five times more likely to die in childbirth than a white woman in this country. Five times. Now, what does that mean? Am I just to be indifferent to that statistic or passive or pass by on the other side and say, well, I like society as it is. It suits me fine. And that's not my issue. Well, I, I'm, I'm not racist. Well, I, I, I. There are going to be sins of omission that we have to think through. I was very struck by Trevor Pierce's youth lockdown talk on uh, Sunday the 7th of June. Do look at it online. Uh, at one point, he highlights the difference between aggressive racism and subtle racism uh, in the way in which two Manchester City footballers, one black, one white, are reported as they do the same thing, which is buy an expensive home for their families. There's a subtle racism in the way that this is reported. Anyway, have a look online at that. It's very striking. Uh, one is uh, acknowledged and complimented, the other is run down, and you can get, guess which is which. Have a look at the talk. Now, the key question here, though, is the one Dada highlighted. He said, how do we view life through the lens of God? How do we stand in the gap and shine the light on sin and dig out the root of sin? Now, our passage today, 1 Samuel 7, was chosen months ago before recent events. Uh, following which we decided we needed to interview Dada and respond to the theme of racism. And as you know, the giving today will be outside all souls around that area. But it, it's actually incredibly pertinent, this passage, as it takes sin seriously and reveals the difference repentance makes to the nation of Israel, which is the Old Testament picture of the church today. In chapter 4 and chapter 7, there's a battle between the Israelites and the Philistines. Both battles end in great slaughter. It's clear in chapter 4 and chapter 7 that it's the Lord who brings defeat and victory. Both battles involved a place called Ebenezer, yet there is a total transformation. 
Because of repentance, we see crushing defeat go to complete victory. We see groaning despair go to glorious hope. And it's all because of chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. This is the key difference. Then all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord. So Samuel said to all the Israelites, if you're returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only, and he'll deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. In chapter 4, there had been catastrophic defeat with 4,000 dead because Israel's leaders had not humbled themselves before the Lord and had not been to Samuel to listen to God's word. Inevitably, God gave them over to defeat. The Philistines conquered the army. They killed Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and they captured the ark. And the word Ichabod, which means the glory of God has departed, was the verdict. But now, having suffered under the Philistine yoke for long enough, the Israelites want to repent. They long to repent. And we see what true repentance means. It means, and here's my first heading, returning wholeheartedly to the Lord. Samuel says in verse 3, if you're returning to God with all your hearts. So this isn't just about being found out. It isn't about the externals of religion. It's not about treating God like the tax man, where I seek to get away with giving the bare minimum. It's not about just giving God my loose change. No, please see how they view their sin in verse 6. When they'd assembled in Mizpah, They drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day, they fasted, and there they confessed, we've sinned against the Lord. When water is poured out on the ground, it's wasted and useless. And that's our spiritual state, they say, wasted and useless. And they fasted and confessed, which means that they weren't too quick, too keen to rush to forgiveness. No, they dwelt on and lamented their sin. That's not just sorrow because of the mess they've caused. There's sorrow over the sin itself. And so they say, we we forsake our sin and we turn to God. Secondly, in verse 3, we see that true repentance involves, and here's the second heading, rejecting idolatry. Samuel says, if you're returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then you must rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only. And of course, if Samuel has to say, rid yourselves, it assumes Israel was involved in worshipping the gods of fertility, farming, love and war, the the Canaanite gods, the Philistine gods. And the Ashtoreths were basically the gods of sex and success. And you can see the appeal, can't you? If you were worried about your crops for the next year, it's quite nice to be told to go and engage in some ritual sex. It was deeply attractive to the carnal and natural self. Of course, these foreign gods were idols, and as we think of them, we might dismiss them. As we think of people of another religion bowing down to a family shrine or a totem pole. But idolatry is about cardiology. It's about how our hearts work. It's about our internal worlds. And here is the issue. So often, we're blind to these idols. So our hearts deify good things like financial security, health, career, family, family life, job security, reputation, fulfilling our potential, these good things become ultimate things. They become the things that give me significance and security, safety and status. And they gain a controlling position in our hearts. They enslave us. And often we're blind to them. The Bible uses three metaphors to describe how people relate to the idols of the heart. They love them, they trust them, and they obey them and yet we're blind to them. And if I ask you what gives you your sense of value, of beauty, of significance and worth, where do you find your identity, what are your daydreams and your nightmares, then we begin to take the mask off and spot them. And Tim Keller says the key is just to spot them. So often with this whole race issue, we've got to ask, have we even seen these idols? as we wander along with these sins of omission? What are we spotting as we hold on to what makes us safe and secure and can can keep others out? Now, Luther said, at the heart of all sin is idolatry. 
And when it comes to idols, I've got to get the code on them. It's why the Bible cries out, may no unseen sin rule over us, because they so easily can. It's why it says, search me, O God, and know my sin. And can I say again, we're never going to root out racism and the sins of omission unless, church family, we take idolatry seriously. Why else are the first two commandments about idolatry? It's because it's such a crunch issue. It's such a crunch issue for our hearts. It's such a crunch issue for the sins of omission. And of course, we're not just talking about racism here. We're talking about blind spots in so many areas. And that's why it's complicated. But let me tell you, you can, you can meet Christian workers and they can be wonderful, wonderful, wonderful in so many areas. Then in one area, they're appalling. What's going on? I think of a church warden I came across oh, 20 years ago, not at this church. And his daughter got engaged to a, a man of a different race. Now, this church warden was wonderful in terms of Christian giving, Christian witness, Christian service. But when it came to this, his daughter marrying someone of a different race who was a wonderful, fine Christian man, he just collapsed. He'd never been through those idols. Never occurred to him. Yet there was something he wanted to do for his daughter that wasn't that, when this was a lovely Christian man who proposed and married her. Now, the Bible concept of idolatry shows it to be made up, again, of psychological, cultural, social, and spiritual categories. But there's a huge danger in the church that as we're blinded by our idols, our, our faith ceases to be in God, but in our agenda for God. Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, die in chapter 4 because they refuse to listen to Samuel, and they don't begin to take repentance seriously, and they abuse their position for their own ends. They have their idols, they go on serving them, and it leads to judgment and death, and that's a warning to us as God raises up other leaders. He raises up Samuel, someone who will be loyal, who will have a heart for the Lord. But as we close, what is remarkable about this passage is that in the midst of pouring out water, confessing their sin, ridding themselves of idols, and crying out to the Lord for rescue, there is a sacrifice. So imagine it, the Philistines are marching towards Israel to attack. They're overwhelmingly outnumbered, and we read that Samuel took a suckling lamb, verse 9, and sacrificed it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Of course, the death of this lamb points to the fact that at the heart of the Christian community is the sacrifice of Jesus, in which by his death on the cross, Jesus was punished for all our sins of commission and omission, for all our sins of self-righteousness, as we point at the sins of others and perhaps don't see our own sin. And it means that as I look at my sin, I'm in a safe place. As I see the sins of omission, I'm not then left in a culture where there is morality without forgiveness, which is so much of what we see today. I think it's a terrifying place to be. This morality without forgiveness, this finger pointing, and it's, you know, there's no mercy. No, the cross means that God is for me, that he's forgiven me, so I can look at my sin and I can repent. I can find forgiveness at the foot of the cross. It means that I can say, Lord, there's this, this whole area of, of idolatry, and it's led to these sins of omission, and racism is part of that. Lord, please help me. Please forgive me. Help me to have the grace to ask people's forgiveness. Help me to, to change. But Lord, thank you so much. I'm secure. I'm a man of the cross. I'm a woman of the cross. I'm forgiven. I'm in a family. Amen. 1 John 1, 8 and 9. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us all our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Oh, Father, help us please not to be defensive. Help us to look hard at where we've crossed the road, where we've not bothered. Help us to be aware of what the culture's doing and what it's saying. And help us please, Lord, to be better at being a church family together, serving the Lord Jesus in this world. Amen.
ashes I need not, nor earth's empty praise. You, my inheritance through all my days, all of your treasures to me you impart. I King of heaven, the first in my heart. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Would you join me in a final prayer? So Samuel said to all the Israelites, if you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only. May the Lord have mercy upon us and may the blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with each one of us today and forevermore. Amen.